الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين واللعن الدائم على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونريد أن نمن على الذين استضعفوا في الأرض ونجعلهم أئمة ونجعلهم الوارثين Respected brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I begin by congratulating you all on the auspicious occasion and the end of the period of mourning. You know, we have times in our Islamic calendar, days of mourning, days of aza, days of sadness, like the days of Ashura, the days where we commemorate the martyrdom of Imam Hussein and the Imams of the Ahl Bayt and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And we also have days of happiness. We have days where the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt and the followers of the Ahlul Bayt are happy. Days of good news for the lovers of the Ahlul Bayt With the end, with the martyrdom of Imam al Hassan al Askari on the 8th of Rabi' al Awwal. After that begins the period of happiness for the Ahlul Bayt salam. The period of mourning ends and the period of joy begins for several reasons. One is what we will be talking about today inshallah and tonight and that is the beginning of the imamah of Imam Al-Mahdi Al-Muntadar Ajalallah Ta'ala Atarajah Al-Sharif and that was the beginning of the ghaybah of the Imam as well. And there is a lot that's going on because Imam al Mahdi is an Imam not like any of the other Imams. He's an Imam and we, and we cannot treat him like we treat the other Imams. The other Imams we celebrate on the day of their birth and we cry on the day of their, the day they passed away, the day they were martyred. Imam al Mahdi is an, a living Imam amongst us and with us and he sees us. If we don't see the Imam, that doesn't mean he doesn't see us. The Imam is in Ghaibah. And we have to treat the Imam as if he's alive with us and amongst us. And this is the quality. These are the qualities of the righteous. These are the qualities of the believers. So we will talk about that, inshallah. Another reason for the joy and happiness is that on the 9th of Rabi' al-Awwal corresponds with the days and the day that some of the enemies of the Ahlul Bayt they perished and they left this world. So these are days of happiness for the Ahlul Bayt because these individuals they actively hurt the Ahlul Bayt They actively hurt Rasulullah and Fatima al Zahra and the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt in their actions and what they did. So, according to some narrations, that the ninth of Rabi' al Awwal is the day where the Ahlul Bayt heard good news. And this is why we celebrate on this day. This is why we consider it a day of celebration and the end of the period of mourning. But now, inshallah, we will focus on Imam al-Mahdi al-Muntadar ajalallahu ta'ala farajah al-Sharif, the Imam of our time, and the man who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised that he will come and rid the world of oppression and tyranny after it has been filled with injustice, rid the world of the oppression and establish justice and peace. 
And this is a promise in the Quran, in several verses of the Quran. And in another verse, Allah says, وَلَقَدْ كَتَبْنَا فِي الزَّبُورِ مِنْ بَعْدِ الذِّكْرِ أَنَّ الْأَرْضَ يَرَثُهَا عَبَادِيَ الصَّالِحُونَ We have written in the Psalms of David and the dhikr, meaning the Torah and the Quran, that the earth will be inherited by the righteous. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَعَدَ اللَّهِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ God has made a promise, several occasions in the Qur'an, that the mu'mineen, the righteous, at the end of time, there will come a time that the righteous will be the ones ruling on earth. And this will be manifested through Imam al-Mahdi al-Muntadar, who Rasulullah says in multiple hadith, narrated by Sunnis and Shias, that at the end of time, Rasulullah says in a hadith that if there was one day left, if there was only one day left in the end of this world, meaning it's going to be Yawm Al-Qiyamah, Allah will prolong that day until someone from my progeny, from the children of Fatima, he will come and he will establish justice and he will rule. And that is Imam Al-Mahdi Al-Muntadar Al-Jalallah Ta'ala Faraja Al-Sharif. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi he tells the Muslims, and this is a hadith narrated in Bukhari. And Bukhari, he dies year 256 after Hijrah. He's narrated all of these hadith. Muslim, he dies around the same era. These are all Sunni scholars. They narrate a hadith regarding Imam al-Mahdi. Bukhari dies year 256. Imam al-Mahdi is born year 255. So this means that Bukhari and Muslim and Ahmed ibn Hanbal and others, they're writing and they're telling people about Imam al-Mahdi and the birth of the Savior, and Imam al-Mahdi is being born. But they don't know that Imam al-Mahdi is born. So, this is a promise by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this, there's a hadith accepted by all Muslims. مَنْ مَاتَ وَلَمْ يَعْرِفْ إِمَامَ زَمَانٍ this is unanimously accepted by all Muslims. The one who dies and does not recognize and know the Imam of their time, this person dies the death of the Jahiliyyah, dies the death of the pagans. What does this mean? This means that at any given time, there is a divine representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just because I don't See, the Imam does not mean that the Imam does not exist. From the beginning of creation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought down Adam. Until now, there has always been a divine representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on earth. From Adam all the way to Imam al-Mahdi al muntala Because we believe in our aqidah, in our ideology, we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not leave people without a divine guide. So there has to be a divine guide, a divine representative at any given time. And we believe that that divine representative is Imam al-Mahdi al-Muntadar ajalallahu ta'ala farajur al-Sharif. Yes, all Muslims believe in Imam al-Mahdi. Some people they have the idea that the concept of the belief in Imam al-Mahdi is something that is only exclusive to the Shi'as. No, all Muslims. In fact, as we mentioned, other religions believe in a Messiah at the end of time. And Rasulullah, he tells the Muslims, and this is also narrated in Bukhari. He tells them, كَيْفَ بِكُمْ إِذَا ظَهَرَ بْنُ مَرْيَمْ وَإِمَانُكُمْ مِنْكُمْ What will you do? What will you be? When the son of Mary, meaning Jesus, he descends, and the one who's leading the prayer is from you, the Muslims, meaning Imam al-Mahdi. So all Muslims believe that Jesus will be praying behind this divine Savior that will be sent at the end of time. Yes, there are some minor differences, and this is what we are talking about today. We believe that Imam al-Mahdi was born on the 15th of Sha'ban in the year 255 after Hijrah. 
year 255 after Hijrah, Imam Al Mahdi was born in Samarra, and his father, Imam Al Hassan Al Askari, passes away in the year 260 after Hijrah on the 8th of Rabi'ah Al Awwal. So the Imam was five years old when his father passes away. And the Imam transitions to Imam al Mahdi. And this was something that was not strange for the Shias of the time. Because Imam al Jawad became an Imam when he was seven years old. Imam al Hadi becomes an Imam when he is around eight years old. So none of the Shias question that someone could be a divine representative while they're young. Was it Jesus? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Jesus was a baby. Jesus was a baby. His mother is carrying him in the cradle. And he begins to speak. This is this is Isa If Jesus speaks when he's a divine representative when he's a newborn. Imam al Hadi, Imam al Jawad, Imam al Mahdi is also five years old, he becomes an Imam. If someone's appointed by Allah, there's no problem whatsoever. This is one. We, the Shias, we believe he was born. Some of the other schools of thought, they say he will come at the end of time. They still believe in Imam al Mahdi, but they say he will come at the end of time. They don't believe that he was born, not all of them. This is one issue. And the second, which is the occultation that we are talking about today, that is the ghaybah. We believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prolonged the life of Imam Al Mahdi, and he is in a ghaybah, he's in an occultation right now. And this is also not a strange concept. There were prophets of Allah that were in an occultation. There were prophets of Allah that were in a ghaybah. Prophet Musa alayhi salam, he was the prophet of Bani Israel and the leader of Bani Israel, but he separated from them. He goes and he stays at Madian for 10 years with Shu'aib. He's still their prophet, he's still their guy. He was still the leader of the Israelites, yet he was in a neighbor. He was away from their eyes. That doesn't mean he was non-existent. He was just away from them, and they did not see him. Just as we do not see the Imam of our time right now. Another prophet who's in Neiba right now, which prophet is it? Jesus. Prophet Isa he's in Neiba right now. Prophet Isa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran clearly, Ma wa ma They did not kill him, they did not crucify him. Jesus is alive. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hid him from the eyes. So if Allah <coughs> hides Musa from the people for a brief while, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places Jesus in an occultation, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prolongs the life of Prophet Nuh, Prophet Nuh, didn't Allah prolong his life? Allah says in the Quran, he was with his people for 950 years. A man, he lives for 950 years. Is that something difficult for God? For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that something that's impossible? No, of course not. So we believe that Imam al-Mahdi al-Muntadar is alive. He was born on the 15th of Sha'ban in the year 255 after Hijrah. And as soon as his father passes away, Imam al-Mahdi al-Muntala enters into occultation. In fact, his occultation began from the day he was born. Many people did not know that Imam al-Mahdi was born. Imam al-Hassan al-Askari, his father, he had a very difficult task, a very difficult duty. One is that he has to Preserve the life of his son because the authorities at that time, the, khali, the, khali, the caliphs at that time, they brought Imam al Hadi and Imam al Hassan al Askari all the way from Medina to Samarra. And the Muslim capital was in Samarra at that time. Why did they do that? Because they wanted to monitor the house of the Imam. And this is why the house of Imam al Hadi and the Imam al Hassan al Askari was a house that was filled with spies. And the Imams were living in extreme case of taqiyya, where they could not publicly speak to their followers. Imam al-Hasan al-Askari, he tells his companions, because the Khalifa, 
of the time, he would summon Imam al Hassan al Askari every Monday and every Thursday. He tells him, You have to come and sit with the Khalifa. So Imam al Hassan al Askari, he leaves his house, he's walking to the palace of the Caliph. Imam al Hassan al Askari he signals to the Shia and he tells them, Don't even say salam to me. Don't even point at me because if you point at me, your life will be in danger. If you recognize that I am your Imam, in public, your life is going to be in danger. So this is the extreme case of taqiyya that the Imams of the Ahl bayt were living in. And when Imam al-Mahdi was born, Imam al-Hasan al-Askari, he hid him from some people and he revealed him to others. One man who he revealed him to is a man by the name of Ahmed ibn Ishaq. Ahmed ibn Ishaq is a scholar that lives in Qom. He lives in Qom. Imam al-Hasan al-Askari is in Samara. The Imam, he writes a letter to him. Because Ahmed ibn Ishaq was the leader of the Shia living in Qom. There was a group of Shias living in Qom at that time. And it was the beginning of the Hawza. One of the oldest seminaries in the Muslim world was in fact in Qom. Because a group of families from Yemen, Ash'ariyin, they were in Kufa, they were persecuted by Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al thaqafi so they migrated to Qom. They lived in Qom, and there, during the time of Imam al-Rada, during the time of Imam al-Jawad, Imam al-Hadi, Imam al-Askari, it became a hub of Muslim scholars, Shia scholars. And the father of Shaykh al-Saduq was also there at that time. And this is why we believe that Shaykh al-Saduq was born, one of our great scholars, he was born as a result of the dua of Imam al-Mahdi. Because he was living at the same time. And this man, this marja of the Shi'as, the scholar of the Shi'as, Ahmed ibn Ishaq, he comes, and the Imam alayhi salam, Imam al-Askari, he brings him to his home, he tells him, I want to show you my son. He brings him, and he shows him a baby in the cradle. He shows him a young child in the cradle and he tells him, this is your Imam. This is your Imam after me. When I die, he's going to be your Imam. And then he says, I saw that the child began to speak at a young age. He began to speak and he says, Ana Allahi fil ard wal muntaqim min wa la tatlub atharan ba'da ayn ya Ahmed ibn he tells him, I am baqiyatullahi fil ard. I am the remaining proof of God on earth. This is why one of the titles of Imam al Mahdi is what? Ya baqiyatullah. When we say salam to Imam al Mahdi, we don't say assalamu alayka ya amir al mu'mineen. A man asks Imam al Sadiq, he tells him, when we see Imam al Mahdi, should we say assalamu alayka ya amir al mu'mineen? He tells him, no. You say, As-salamu alayka ya baqiyyat Allahi fi ardah. The remaining proof of God on earth. Because he's the only proof, he's the only living proof of God on earth. For over a thousand years, he's the hujjah of Allah. He's the divine representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says, Ana baqiyyat Allahi fi ardah. I am the proof of God on earth. Wal muntaqin min a'da'ah. And I am the one who will seek vengeance from the enemies of God. This is why we believe that the one who will seek real vengeance, the real day of happiness for the mu'mineen will be when? When Imam Mahdi rises. That is the day of true happiness. That is the day of true victory for the mu'mineen, for the believers. وَلَا تَطْلُبْ أَثَرًا بَعْدَ عَيْنْ يَا أَحْمَدِ بِنْ إِسْحَاقِ then the Imam tells him, you don't need to find traces after you have seen me, O oh, Ahmed ibn Ishaq. So the man, Ahmed ibn Ishaq, he becomes very happy that the Imam, Imam al-Askari, he brought him. And he saw Imam al-Mahdi. And we have several traditions where <coughs> Imam al-Askari, days before his death, he calls 40 of his companions. He tells them, come. You see this child, he looks like a child, but he's an imam. He's going to be the leader. He is the imam after you. And 
Imam al-Hasan al-Askari was poisoned on the first of Rabi' al-Awwal. So for eight days, the Imam is in pain. The Imam is passing away, he's in pain, and the authorities, they know that he's poisoned. They poisoned him, the, the caliph poisoned him. So as soon as he sees any signs of sickness, and the Imam, of course, Imam al-Hasan al-Askari was 28 years old the day he passed away. Meaning Imam al-Mahdi lost his father, Imam al-Mahdi was five, and his father was 28 years old. Imam al-Hasan al-Askari was one of the youngest of the Imams. Of course, there was a younger Imam, Imam al-Jawad. But his Imama, the period of his Imama was only six years. Six years. It lasted for only six years. Anyways, they see that the Imam is sick, so they send doctors. But they are really spies. They send them in the house to monitor the house. Why? Why so much insistence on seeing what's in the house? Because the Khulafa and the people, all of them, they knew that the 12th from this progeny is going to be the leader that's going to fight oppression, that's going to rid the world of injustice. So the Caliph, al Mu'tamid al Abbasi, at that time, he was very afraid for his life. Because he knows the hadith of the Prophet is a truthful one. He knows Rasulullah. And this is a hadith that's narrated by all Muslims. The twelfth one of this family. So they were monitoring the house of Imam al-Askari. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hid him from <coughs> the eyes of the public. Imam al-Askari passes away. His mother, Sayqal, she was there. And his mother, the mother of Imam al-Askari, she was also the caretaker of Imam al-Mahdi. We have a tradition that says... That Imam al-Askari, he sent his mother one year before his death, he sent her to Mecca, to Umrah, to Medina and Mecca, all the way from Samara, so that she knows. Because the family of Imam al-Hadi and Imam al-Askari, they have been taken all the way from Medina to Samara. They don't know what's going on there. So he sends her so that she could be familiar. Because this, some suggest that she took Imam al-Mahdi with her, with her to Medina. And he was taken out of Samara for after the death of his father. Anyways, Imam al Hassan al Askari passes away, and Imam al Mahdi is the one who does the salah, and he does the ghusl and the kafan. There's two funerals going on for the Imam. One is the government, they have prepared, the authorities, the Khalifa, he has prepared a state funeral for Imam al-Hasan al-Askari because of course he's the grandson of the Prophet, he's a knowledgeable figure in the community. He has prepared for him a state funeral. So the, house, the body of the Imam has been washed and it's in the house. But the Shias, they gather to do a private salah before it's, the body is taken out for the public funeral, for the public salah in front of everyone. Here, they, they come and they stand. And the brother of Imam al-Hasan al-Askari, a man by the name of Ja'far, and they refer to him as Ja'far al-Kathar, Ja'far the liar. Because he started telling people he's the Imam after Imam al-Askari. So Ja'far al-Kathar, he's standing there, he wants to lead the prayer, and there are several people in the house with him. And suddenly, they say that this young child, Imam al-Mahdi, he comes, he's young, he tells him, oh my dear uncle, move away. He pushes him away and he says the salah. He does the salah and then he disappears. They go and they try to follow him. They try to go after him, but there's no trace of him. And that was the last time the Imam was seen publicly in front of people. And then of course the body of Imam Hassan al-Askari was taken out and the brother of the Khalifa led the prayer, the public prayer. Of course the prayer had already been done by the Imam. And then Imam Hassan al-Askari is buried in his own home. Today when you go to Samarra, inshallah, if you all go for the ziyarah of Imam al-Hadi and Imam Hassan al-Askari, out of all of the places, the, the, the Imams, with the exception of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, they're all buried outside of their homes. Imam al-Husayn is not buried in his home. Amir al-Mu'mineen is not buried in his home. Imam al-Hasan is not buried in his home. 
The other Imams were not buried in, his home, in their home. Only Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he ordered that bury me where I passed away. And they buried him right there in his home. Imam al Hassan al Askari is also buried in his home, and Imam al Hadi as well. This is why today, when I go for the ziyara of Imam al Mahdi, or when I go for the ziyara of Imam al Hadi and Imam al Askari, you're actually stepping in the house of the Imam. And that's something special. You're actually walking in the house of the Imam, but the owner of the Imam is not there, or you don't see the Imam. Because the inheritor of Imam al Askari is who? So <coughs> that, that is what happened to Imam Al Hassan Al Askari and the Imam Al Mahdi, and that is when the Ghaybah began, the minor occultation began. Subhanallah, that same day, the same day Imam Al Hassan Al Askari passes away, there's a state funeral going on. Ja'far Al Kadhab, he declares that he is the leader. He declares that he is the leader after for the Shia. A group of mu'mineen, a group of believers, they come from Qom. And they have their khums and their zakat with them. And they were accustomed to delivering their khums and their zakat to the Imam. To Imam al-Hasan al-Askari, before that to Imam al-Hadi, before that to Imam al-Jawad. So they come and they enter into Samara and they see that Imam al-Hasan al-Askari has passed away. So they are, they don't know. Who, th who should they give this amana to? Who should they deliver it to? So they are going and they see Ja'far. Ja'far, the brother of Imam Hassan al-Asri, tells them, give it to me. I am the leader of the Shia. They tell him, they tell him, we will give it to you, but we have to ask you some questions. Because whenever we used to come and see the Imam, Imam al-Askari or any of the Imams, they would show us signs, signs that they are the Imam. For example, the Imam would know all of our names. Do you know our names? He says, no, how am I supposed to know what your names are? And then they also, they tell him, the Imam would also know exactly how much is in the purse. Exactly how much is being carried, how much we're bringing. And they're not only bringing their own money, they're bringing, they're delivering the amana, the, the trust they have from the people that have given them. So the Imam would tell them, you have, for example, this much and this much exactly, dinar, this much dirham with you. And these are your names. Do you know? Can you tell us how much we have? So no, I don't have knowledge of the faith. They tell them, then get lost. What, what are you trying to... Why are you telling us that you're the Imam? They realize that he's not the Imam. So, Ja'fa, he goes to the Khalifa, al muqtamid and he, and he snitches on him. He tells them, he tells them there's, there's a group of people here, and they're saying that, they're saying that they're, they're in search of an Imam, and he tries to cause a problem for them. They are there for a while, and they don't know what to do. They're in a hayra, they're in a state of confusion. They don't know who the Imam is. The narration says, suddenly someone comes and calls them, tells them, come to me. Come to me, follow me. They follow him, and then he takes them in a house, in the room, he sees there's a chair, and Imam al-Mahdi is wearing green. He's sitting, he's telling, he tells them, I am the Imam. Oh, Fulan, oh, Fulan, oh, Fulan. He says their names and he tells them exactly how much they brought with them. This is the sign of the Imam. This is one of the signs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we don't believe that the Imam have absolute access, full access to Ilm al Ghayb. Ilm al Ghayb is, is the knowledge of the unseen belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to the prophets and the imams, Allah gives them access to some of that knowledge. And this is how we believe that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi how did Rasulullah tell us so much stuff? Because Allah gave them access to that great. Same with the imams and Imam al-Mahdi. So he tells them exactly who they are and how much they give it to him. But he tells them from now on, you don't come to Samarwa. And you don't give me personally the amana that you have. 
From now on, you give it to Uthman ibn Sa'id, the first deputy. There are four deputies for Imam al-Mahdi, four deputies, ambassadors, and this is the period of the minor ghaybah. This was a period that lasted for around 70 years. With the death of the final, the fourth deputy, the ghaybah al-Sughra ended, and we entered into the ghaybah al-Kubra where there is no representative of the Imam. The Imam, he tells them, the deputy after me is Uthman ibn Sa'id. Uthman ibn Sa'id was a man who was the representative of Imam al-Hasan al-Askari. And he was a companion of Imam al-Hadi before that. So he was very close to the Imams. Now, he becomes the representative. And the Imam says, from now on you don't come to Samarra, my deputy is going to be in Baghdad. And all of these four deputies of the Imam, Uthman ibn Sa'id, and then his son Muhammad ibn Uthman, and then Al Hussein ibn Ruh and Nawbati, and then Ali ibn Muhammad al Samari. These four, they are the deputies and ambassadors of Imam Al Mahdi al Muntadar. And they would, people, they would come to them, they would ask them questions, they would write the questions on a paper, on a, in a letter, and then they would keep it with them, and then a few days later, the Imam comes back. The, the, the deputy comes back with the handwriting of the Imam, not his handwriting. The handwriting of the Imam and the signature of the Imam, and they would see that the answer is there. Throughout those 70 years, 69, 70 years, a lot of the information that we have, a lot of problems, they were answered, a lot of issues of confusion, they were answered through these deputies. Some of the du'as that we recite right now, some of the du'as, supplications, like du'a al-iftitah, for example, in the month of Ramadan, we recite it, and other du'as, these come to us from the deputies of Imam al-Mahdi al-Muntadar. Uthman ibn Sa'id, he was passing away, then Imam al-Mahdi, he writes him a letter, he tells him, after you is going to be your son, Muhammad ibn Uthman, Muhammad the son of Uthman. Muhammad ibn Uthman, he is a deputy of the Imam for decades, for a very for a very long time. And then comes Al Hussein ibn Ruh al Nawbakti. After Al Hussein ibn Ruh al Nawbakti comes Ali ibn Muhammad al Samari. Then six days, six days before the death of Ali ibn Muhammad al Samari, six days before the death of the fourth deputy. A letter comes to him from Imam al-Mahdi. What does the letter say? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya Ali ibn Muhammad al-Samari. O Ali ibn Muhammad. A'zam Allah ajra ikhwanika feek. Fa inna kamayyit ma baynaka wa bayn sittata ayyam. My condolences to your companions, to your friends, because you're going to die in six days. The Imam is telling him, you're going to die in six days, exactly six days. Fajma amrak, prepare yourself. And do not pass it on. Do not say that there is a, another person after you. The direct representation has come to an end. Because now, the greater occultation is going to begin after your death. There is going to be no more dhuhur, no more appearance. Because during the time of the minor occultation, the Imam would reveal himself sometimes to some people. Except with the permission of Allah, there will be the reappearance. وَذَٰلِكَ بَعْدَ طُولِ الْأَمَدْ وَقَسْوَةِ الْقُلُوبِ And that will be after a very long time and the hearts are going to be hardened. Many, many people are going to not even care about them. Many people are going to totally forget. Some people are not even going to believe in the Imam anymore. Some people are going to say, what is this? They're going to totally reject this belief وَقَسْوَةِ الْقُلُوبِ وَامْتِلَاءِ الْأَرْضِ جَوْرًا 
and the earth will be filled with oppression. Just as what we are seeing today. Just as the times that we are living in <coughs> right now, there's going to come people that claim that they are the representatives of the Imam, the direct representatives of the Imam. Whoever claims that they are a direct representative of the Imam before Khuruj Sufyani, before the Sufyani appears, and before the Sayha, before the loud scream or the loud yell or the loud bang that will be heard by everyone, then this person is alive. And these are some of the signs of the end of time. Some people ask, what are the signs of the, 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 the Imam? One of them that is perhaps in most of the ahadith mentioned is Khuruj al-Sufyani. Someone by the name of Sufyani, he will come and he will appear. Now, this has not happened yet. I remember a few years ago when Daesh, ISIS came out, some people said, okay, Sufyani might be from them. It wasn't the case. We have to wait. We have to be patient. And the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, مِنْ أَفْضَلْ أَعْمَالْ أُمَّتِي انْتَظَارَ الْفَرَجِ From the best deeds of my ummah is to wait, be patient, actively wait for the faraj. And then he says, وَلَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ الْعَلِيهِ الْعَظِيمِ Now someone might ask today, these marajah that we follow, the scholars, the ayatollahs that we follow, aren't they the representatives of the imam? The answer is they're not the direct representatives of the imam. They, don't, they do not have direct relationship with the imam. They do not correspond with the imam. Yes, they tell us what's halal and what's haram, using the tools that they have, the Qur'an, the Hadith, the Aql, the Sunnah, and they derive laws with the best of their capability. They do ijtihad. They try to derive the laws using their powers and whatever means they have, the intellectual power, to derive laws. Those individuals, those four representatives, no, they would not do ijtihad. Someone asks them a question, they write it down, they go and they give it to the imam, the imam gives them the answer. They wouldn't do the ishtihad on their own. They, would, they were connected with the imam. Now, none of our scholars are directly connected with the imam. They are general representatives. Na'ib'am, not na'ib khas. Meaning the general representative. Someone who's following the guidelines of the representatives of the imam. Imam Hassan Asqari, he laid out those guidelines. He says, if you see someone from the fuqaha, from the scholars, sa'inan li nafsih, Someone who is protecting themselves, not doing haram, going against their desires, and this person is a faqih, a scholar, فَعَلَى الْعَوَامِ أَنْ يُقَلِّدُوا The lay people, the laymen, will follow this person. So, we have the ghayba, the, the, the niyaba, the, the direct representative, and we have the general representative. The direct representation ended with the death of Ali ibn Muhammad as samari and this is exactly what happened. Six days later, his Shia, his companions, they come, and because the letter says you will die in six days. Six days later, they come, they gather, they see him on his deathbed. They see that he is dying. So they gather around him, they tell him, who is after you? Is there someone after you? Because the one before him would say, this is after me. And the one before that would say, this, this person is after me. And they tell him, who is after you? He says, لِلَّهِ الْأَمْرُ هُوَ The matter belongs to Allah now. And then he takes his breath and he passes away. And the ghaybat al-Subra ended after around 70 years. And the ghaybat al-Kubra began. Now we believe that Imam al-Mahdi was and still is directing and guiding the mu'mineen. We believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not bring an imam who is totally absent and away from people. No, the imam guides people, the imam helps people. We don't realize it. We have instances, we have letters that the imam wrote to Shaykh al-Mufid, a scholar, Shaykh al-Mufid, who, who was a scholar after the death of the fourth 
the fourth deputy, although he was not the direct representative of the, of the imam, he was a scholar, but he writes a letter. And he answers the question that some people ask. Some people were asking, how do I benefit from the imam when the imam is not with me? If we don't have access to the imam, how do we benefit? The imam, he himself, he answers in that letter to Shaykh al-Mufid. He tells him, you benefit from me like you benefit from the sun on a cloudy day. Just because you don't see the sun does not mean you don't benefit from the sun. Just because your eyes do not fall on something does not mean you do not benefit from it. We benefit from the Imam in ways that we don't realize. And the Quran gives us examples. In Surah Al-Kahf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the example of Musa and that learned person, Khidr. Right? Khidr. He was doing things behind the scenes. Khidr, he goes and he punctures a boat. Musa tells him, why are you puncturing the boat? Tells him, you'll learn. Then later on he goes and he builds a wall. And then he goes and he kills a young person. Musa is confused. And the people, no one knows what's going on. But later on, Khidr tells him, I punctured the boat. Because it belonged to good people. And there was a king that was taking any boat, any ship that was in perfect condition. So I made a hole in it so that the king would not take it. I killed that man because he was bad to his parents and Allah replaced him with, with uh, someone who will be the father, someone who will be from their descendants, will be prophets. And I built that wall because that wall had a treasure under it that belonged to orphans. Now here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Khidr to do things behind the scenes where the orphans didn't know, the people who had their boat, they never realized, that family that lost their son, they didn't realize. But things were happening behind the scenes. Now, if Allah sends Khidr to these individuals that were mu'mineen, that were believers, that does things behind the scenes that will impact their lives. Do you think Imam al-Mahdi does not impact our lives? Maybe you're suffering, maybe you're going through a problem. Allah sends the Imam to do something that will change your life, that will change the course of your life. So it is very possible for the Imam to be involved in our lives. He listens to us, he hears us, and Allah says in the Quran, وَقُلْ اِعْمَلُوا فَسَيَرَ اللَّهِ عَمَلَكُمْ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ Do good deeds because God sees your actions and the Prophet and the Mu'minun and the believers. And the Hadith says that the Mu'mineen are the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt. My dear brothers and sisters, I'm going to end here. If anyone has any questions, any comments, anything they would like to add, anything that was not clear, please feel free to do so. And before that, Sallallahu Alaihi Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. In addition, let's, we can take a quick one, two minute break. We have pizza in the back, refreshments, snacks, so please help yourself. And we can eat as we benefit from Sayyid Salah. Salah ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Yes, bro, you have a question? We were just going to let the sisters go first, and then the guys are going to go up and eat. Because it's right. not the, the same The brother team. suggests let's have the sisters go up first, and then we can have the guys go up. Also, if you have a question and would like a microphone, just raise your hand and the microphone will be brought to you. If you're taking the pizza, please keep it, if, if there's still question and answer, keep it kind of, no, don't be too loud so that people will ask. Yes, sister. Keep it, keep it. Um, you know when we, when we, uh, usually when we give the arena. Yes. Because the, the letter that the Imam was teaching, Hussein ibn Ruh, it tells him this is how you do the letter. So people are taking it literally. Now you don't need to use the name of Hussein ibn Ruh. Now you could write directly to the Imam. Yes. Because during the time of Hussein ibn Ruh, that was the way it was written. Yes. <coughs> Would you like to add something? 
No, you add to Someone who saw the Imam and someone who is claiming to be the representative of the Imam could consider this person a liar. We have instances. There are some scholars, they mention their names in history, that they saw the Imam. They say, for example, you know, Sayyid Mahdi Bahrain Uloom, there's a scholar, Sheikh Al Mufid, for example, there are others. But a lot of these stories, we hear about them once the scholar has passed away. There's no way to actually prove it. How would an individual know? If one sees a sign, for example, there are stories that say Sheikh al um he saw the Imam where he was answering the question. He was answering the question and he was answering wrong. He was not answering correctly. And I believe the case was um, with a lady that had passed away and she was pregnant. So they come, they ask Sheikh al they tell him, what should we do? Should we bury her or should we cut up her stomach and take out the baby? Sheikh al at that time, he said bury her. He used it he, because when someone dies, you're not, you're not allowed to play around with their body and do stuff. So he said, bury her. And from what I recall, a letter came to him or in a way he, he received news that no, don't bury her. Open up her stomach and take out the baby and then bury it. So that was one correspondence that was between between one of our scholars and the uh, and the Imam. Yes. 